church this evening. Uh, I want to make a few announcements here before we get started. Uh, next Sunday morning, which will be the 6th, we have missionary Tony Rickshaw, <laughs> and that's R-Y-K-O S-O-S, I think, I don't even know how to spell it, but uh, uh, he's a member at Cornerstone Baptist and uh, uh, going to Belize. And he'll be with us during the Sunday school hour uh, talking about his field. So uh, I mentioned that because we have some kids that are interested in following the Lord in, in baptism after they've been saved, and uh, we're going to try to move that to the 13th. So if you know some kids there that are wanting to join in with that group, and there might be some adults uh, that uh, need to uh, be baptized as well, uh, keep in mind that'll be the 13th, all right? So that's not next Sunday, but that's the following Sunday. Next Sunday, we've got a missionary that's going to Belize. He's going to be with us during the Sunday school hour. And then the 20th is when we'll have that honorary dinner for Brother Jack and Beth. That works out, Brother. I know you've got some place you're going to be. Is that this yeah, week? That's this week. Okay, all right. So that shouldn't be a problem. Lord willing, the 20th, we'll have that honorary dinner for Brother Jack and Sister Beth. All right? All right. Appreciate you being here this evening again. Let's go ahead and go, Lord, in prayer and ask his blessing on the meeting. Brother Ben Henson, would you pray for us, please?
case, uh, you can kind of talk to them, find out where they sit and where they land on all this, and uh, and some of us have already talked, some of us adults already talked, try to help them get there, 
and uh, that, that's in the works. All we need to know is who's interested in going right now. And of course, it's not just young people. Adults can go too. As a matter of fact, Brother Mike needs some adults to go to help him keep up with the young people. <laughs> but uh, it's going to be an exciting trip there, going up there to the ark. Uh, everyone needs to be at the church here at 8 o'clock, and breakfast is going to be provided. Okay, all right. Now let's go ahead and ask the Lord's blessing on the offering. Well, Terry Bowles, would you pray for us? Father, Lord, we are thankful for all you do for the Lord. Good message this morning, Lord God. Again, thank you for the fans, Lord. I know you've given us what we need to hear. And we pray both in our hearts and our ears and your word, Lord God. We thank you for this church. We thank you for the Lord. We thank you for the Lord. We just thank you more than anything. We love you, Jesus Christ, and all you've done for us, Lord God. Just help us do more for you. Give it all to us. Just help us to do the same in return. We love you. Look forward to seeing you. Jesus Christ, and our Lord. Amen. 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 Oh, 
Amen for that blessed assurance. I'm glad it's more than a song. Open your Bible. Let's go to Matthew chapter 6. Turn and I'm going to pray. Father, thank you, Lord, for the opportunity once again to get around your word. Lord, we come. Lord, it's time for church, but we don't want to be here for routine sake. God, I pray that you'll help our motives to be right. Lord, our, our desires to be right. Our affections to be in the right place. Pray, God, that you'll bear witness to the truth. And I ask that you'll help me preach. God, give me utterance tonight. Uh, I pray that you'll guide my thoughts. Help me to be effective in communicating your truth to your people. Lord, we're your people bought by the blood of Jesus Christ. And, uh, Lord, we're to honor you. And we're to live for you. We're to serve you and not man. And I pray, God, that you'll help us get the message tonight. Uh, Lord, I thank you for setting us free. Thank you, Lord God, for that blessed assurance, Lord, that we do belong to you. And I pray, God, tonight, Lord, that you will deal with hearts and our minds. Maybe there's someone here tonight that uh, needs some encouragement. Uh, they need some instruction. Maybe someone uh, needs to make a turn for the better. Lord, I pray if there's someone here that's never been saved, God, they'll understand what it takes to be saved and to know your Son as Savior. God, they'll understand the simplicity of the gospel before they leave here tonight. Lord, I ask that you again just use me for your glory and honor. In Jesus' name, amen. Again, Matthew chapter 6. And uh, in the last message I was preaching here from the Gospel of Matthew, I was preaching on the subject of true righteousness and uh, how it comes to us and what it looks like as Jesus describes it. Uh, here in the Sermon on the Mount, we have the one, the, the, the only one, the king, uh, who is the only potentate. He is the Christ of Israel. Uh, being the Christ means he is God's anointed one. He is God's chosen one. And uh, the Scriptures show us that the man Jesus is indeed the Christ. Uh, he is the promised seed of the woman. He is the promised seed of Abraham. Uh, he is the son of David. He's identified in Scripture, prophesied of as the star of Jacob, the, the one who is called Shiloh from Judah. Uh, the Bible says that the scepter shall not depart out of his hand. Uh, he's the Lord God of Shem, the root of Jesse. Uh, he is that prophet that they were looking for, uh, the priest after the order of Melchizedek. And many from the Old Testament perspective were simply looking for the Christ to appear as their Messiah, having only focused upon those prophetical promises that showed Christ raising up Jerusalem and restoring the, uh, the houses of Israel and Judah and rearing up the temple and all other nations beginning to recognize Him as the King of Righteousness. Uh, that's what they focused on. And so they failed to notice that the other prophecies in the Old Testament uh, had the very Christ suffering the waves of death and being made an offering for sin. And uh, they failed then to, to see that the things that He was going to go through, even the uh, Spirit of God testifying uh, in the voice of the Messiah and prophecy of the Old Testament where His hands would be pierced, uh, His side would be pierced, His uh, back would have deep furrows plowed into it, uh, how His beard would be plucked from His face, and uh, His soul, Isaiah 53 says, would become an offering for sin. And they, they failed to see that cruel death that He would suffer, so therefore they couldn't make heads or tails out of the prophecies that dealt with the bodily resurrection. So they were missing out on a lot. Uh, there was a whole lot of the Bible and, and how it was speaking on the subject of Christ that they simply had no idea about what it was talking about. But following His death, His burial and resurrection, uh, there were eyewitnesses there that had had the Scriptures open to them by the Christ, after He rose from the dead, He taught them things pertaining to the kingdom of God, and, and they began to go out and witness and testify and preach. And even one of their oppressors, a man named Saul of Tarsus, he came to see the light, literally. And uh, he met up with Jesus. And in that encounter, it was made perfectly clear to him uh, that Jesus was the Lord. And once Saul's heart, Paul the Apostle, once Saul's heart turned to Jesus, that veil was taken off of his mind and his heart, 
And he began to put all those scriptures that he had learned together. He began to see Jesus in that Old Testament being prophesied. And he realized that this man Jesus must be the very Christ. And so he would begin to take that approach when he would go into synagogues. The book of Acts shows us how he would just come in and show them a lot of things they were missing about the Christ. He would show prophecies about Christ's death and, and Christ's burial and Christ's resurrection. And then he would say, this man Jesus must needs be the Christ. And that was his approach. Now the fact is, for all that they were looking for, Israel, for all that they were looking for in their Christ, Jesus simply turned out to be a whole lot more. He was a whole lot more than what they expected, more than they realized more than they knew, more than they hoped for, more than they were looking for. Matthew here is a Roman a publican named Levi. One day he's invited uh, by the Lord. He's challenged to follow Jesus and off he went. And later Matthew writes this gospel to report that he's everything and more than they were looking for. And he emphasizes Jesus as the king and with John the Baptist on before him, him the, the message to the house of Israel at that time as they were suffering oppression at the hands of the Roman government there, was that they should turn their hearts to God and repent. And the message was that the kingdom of heaven was at hand. Now, that message was not about going to heaven. And it wasn't about, you know, uh, uh, getting saved. It was about heaven's kingdom coming down to earth. And so there's a difference. The kingdom of heaven, again I remind you, is a literal kingdom that will be on earth. And we say that without a flinch. Amen. We don't worry about that. Uh, you know, that, that in China their government will, uh, will object to that to the point that they'll charge those who preach that with treason. doesn't make the message false. It's true. And the fact that you've got Baptist preachers and Pentecostal preachers, whatever, in these hollers uh, that preach against the doctrine of Christ coming back to earth and reigning doesn't do away with the truth of the message. Uh, the fact is He's coming back. It's what the Bible says. I didn't write it. There's no premillennial preacher that wrote it. More importantly, it didn't write itself. It was written by holy men of God writing as they were moved by the Holy Ghost and the king was here. And the first time he came, he did not come to reign. He came to minister. He came to suffer for sinners' sake. He came to die. And he came to redeem sinners so that we might be a part of his glory which will be displayed in, in his reign. But while he was here, he talked about his kingdom. And in Matthew chapter 5 through chapter 7, he's laying down the constitution of the kingdom. As I preached in the last message there, he's preaching there on true righteousness because his kingdom is going to be a kingdom of righteousness. And the king wants his subjects to be righteous. Tonight here in Matthew chapter 6, I'm just going to try to be brief and talk about the idea of true worship. True worship. True devotion. He says here in verse 1, verse 1, take heed. What is that? That's Jesus saying, listen up. That you do not your alms before men to be seen of them. Otherwise you have no reward of your Father which is in heaven. Let those words ring in our hearts tonight. Ye have no reward of your Father which is in heaven. He says, therefore when thou doest thine alms, do not sound a trumpet before thee as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets that they may have glory of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But when thou doest alms, let not thy left hand know what thy right hand doeth, that thine alms may be in secret, and thy Father, which seeth in secret himself, shall reward thee openly. Now, the Bible talks about that day of the judgment seat of Christ, and on that day they're going to give out crowns. Amen. And crowns shows a right to reign. And we're going to get to enjoy His reign with Him. Some of us will get to reign with Him. I don't know if any of us in here will. Amen. <laughs> I'd hope to. I'd like to. And we have opportunity to do that. But one thing's for sure, there's going to be a time of reward, a designated time of reward, where the Father is going to reward true devotion that's shown towards Him. And He says here in verse 5, And when thou prayest, that thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are. For they love to pray, standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet, and when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy Father which is in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. 
But when ye pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Be not ye therefore locked unto them, for your Father knoweth what things ye have need of before ye ask him. After this manner therefore pray ye, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Moreover, when you fast, be not as the hypocrites of a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces that they may appear unto men to fast. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But thou, when thou fastest, anoint thine head and wash thy face, that thou appear not unto men to fast, but unto the Father which is in secret. And thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourself treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. The light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. But if thine eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness. No man can serve two masters, for either he'll hate the one and love the other, or else he'll hold to the one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. Now I just stopped reading right there. I've really read past my text that I'm going to emphasize tonight. But if we don't do anything else, we'll have read that much scripture together. Uh, but, but the idea, again, of true righteousness and true devotion, true worship, go hand in hand. And it's the desire of the king that what is done is done in order to please God the Father. And it's not done to suit the, the fancies of men. Amen. Men are fickle and you never know what they're going to expect. And if you live in regards to try to impress men, then your life's going to be on shifting sand just like a leaf blowing in the wind. Uh, you never know what men are going to require of you. If that's the way you're going to live, you're going to try to get the pat on the back and the praise from men. You'll find out that it just gets worse and worse. They keep moving the bar worse and worse. After a while, you start trying to conform to what they expect. Then they'll just keep moving the bar on you. And pretty soon, you're just completely, I mean, unrecognizably out of the will of God. Now, he's told them that their righteousness must exceed the righteousness of the Pharisees and the scribes if they would enter into the kingdom. And he goes about to show everyone then what he's talking about. He's, again, not talking about how to go to heaven. He's not talking about how to be saved. He's speaking about his kingdom. What he as the king expects from those that would enter into his kingdom whenever he sets it up. And he's talking about true righteousness. The Pharisees, again, they had an outward righteousness. And for sure that had earned them a respect and honor among men. But Christ emphasizes for us here in this message an inner righteousness. And he goes to reveal the heart of man and the issues of sin and the issues of righteousness. Even the law of God majored on the outward obedience of others until it spoke with authority saying, Thou shalt not covet. And when God's law said, Thou shalt not covet, then that was a sin that might be hidden from the eyes of men. I recall Paul there giving his own testimony again, how that in the eyes of men he said he was blameless. As outward as, as he was there, people saw him concerning the law. He was blameless. There was nothing anyone could point at him and put their finger down on any point of his life and say, aha, there's a problem. But Paul said this. He said, when the law said, thou shalt not covet, he said, that law which was ordained to life, I found to be unto death. He said, I was guilty of a sin that nobody could see. There was a lot that men could see in him and a lot that men noticed in him would have bragged on him and how they would have talked about how outwardly righteous he was. But when it came to that matter of covetousness, no one knew what was in that man's heart, but God knew what was in that man's heart. And Paul said it slew him. He recognized at that point he was a sinner. Again, I explained before when it comes to the law of God, there are those commands God has given that shows us our responsibilities and duties to him. And then there are those commands which shows our responsibilities and duties to others. 
that some deals with God, some deals with man there. And we tend to emphasize those areas when someone has broken God's law in relation to other people because, after all, we are a people. <laughs> and, and we understand what it means to be wrong. And so we identify with that pain of, of being wrong. So thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not kill. If someone violates that command, that's huge. That's a tremendous offense. If someone violates the command, thou shalt not commit adultery. Again, we, uh, we associate with the pain and betrayal from such selfish offenses. And so that, that's a dirty transgression in our eyes. And it should be. It's sin. It's sin. It's condemned. Anybody, amen, would, would condemn those that are guilty as being guilty, amen. I'm, I'm not making a lot of those offenses or those sins, but except to point out that uh, what about when someone takes the name of the Lord in vain? Where's the outrage? Amen. Amen. The same one who gave the same law that says thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not commit adultery, said thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless at taking his name in vain. But who cares about blasphemy? I mean, it's got to be a part of every joke they tell today. I mean, it's funny, ain't it? It's part of just everyday talk. That's the way people talk, preacher. That's the way people are. No outrage, no offense. What about worshiping false gods? God said, Thou shalt have no gods before me. Uh, he said, I'm the Lord thy God. And, and he talked about idols there. Uh, what, what, you know, there's some places I could go tonight and preach, not in a church like this, but I could preach in some churches and preach against the idolatry of the Roman Catholic Church. And you know what? The Christians sitting there would get offended at me for having preached against their idolatry. They say, how could you? I mean, we're talking about Baptist churches. Getting offended because you spoke against someone else's faith. No outrage over idolatry. What about Islam, Buddhism, the Hindus, amen? All that stuff's of the devil. It's the worship of Satan, but society understands that. I mean, that's just someone's faith. Uh, you know, it comes to murder and adultery. They're against that, but they don't see anything wrong with covetousness and idolatry. I mean, that's just people. Outraged about stealing. Why? Because they don't want anybody to steal from them. <laughs> but some child dishonoring their mother and father, <laughs> that doesn't seem to bother anybody. Jesus Christ, what He does is He takes the law of God and in order to reveal uh, the truth about true righteousness... He applies God's law to the heart. And He shows people how far they fall from meeting the standard. Even the Pharisees. He shows that they all fall short there. That, that, that when it's applied to the heart of man, that even those who may never have been guilty of the act of killing or adultery still may have that very sin in their hearts. God just pulls it. The Lord just pulls back the curtain and says, see, there it is. And so uh, the introduction of true righteousness that the king speaks of here is offered in the way of reproof, the light exposing all the ways that come short of God's glory. So bypassing the outward righteousness of the Pharisees, he begins to deal with a matter that showed the Pharisees' righteousness being flawed. I mean, they couldn't see anything wrong with them, but, but Jesus is going to show them, hey, the Them. And so their righteousness, the Lord shows us, is outward. The sin that's in their hearts manifested by their attitude. And so the Lord emphasizes attitudes there. He deals a whole lot with it. He shows what our attitude ought to be when it comes to ourselves. And He emphasizes the need for humility. He shows what our attitude ought to be when it comes to our sins. We're talking about those that mourn. Amen. You ought to be sorry when you sin. You ought to have a contrite spirit. You ought to have a broken heart whenever you sin against the Lord. And he shows what our attitude ought to be towards the Lord and that we hunger and we thirst for righteousness and what our attitude ought to be towards the world when he says, you're the light of this world. And in speaking of our attitudes there, that's what's called the Beatitudes. Christ and the things he says coincides uh, with the fact that righteousness really has to come to us. That we don't have it. 
It's something that we need, but we don't have it. All righteousness does not exceed the righteousness of the Pharisees and scribes. And uh, even what's inside is lacking as well. And the king has shown us that. So again, what is the king doing? He's using the law. And the law is a schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ. And in the end, you know what you got to have? you got to be born again. And you got to have that earnest of the inheritance there in the Spirit of God, which enables us to deny self and live for the Spirit of God, live and walk after the Spirit of God, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. And so it takes revelation from uh, other scriptures to see the point, but he sets it up. The king is using the law to show us our need for a Savior, how far we fall short of true righteousness there. Now, in emphasizing true righteousness, it's principle in our relationship to God. Uh, there has to be truth. There has to be sincerity. God demands it. It has to be sincere. You understand? It can't be put on. It has to be sincere. The Lord expects us to be true in, in our approach to Him and in our service to Him. So in the matter of true righteousness, uh, that fits hand in hand with the matter of true devotion to God. Uh, Jesus warns uh, throughout this about the dangers of hypocrisy. And what hypocrisy is is not what a lot of people think it is. You know, hypocrisy is not falling short of our high ideals. I mean, the, the ultimate standard is the Word of God, and it's perfect. It doesn't lack in any area. And so, is a Christian going to fall short of those goals? Absolutely. It's going to be the experience of every Christian in this house, and every other Christian that you know, that you fell and you fall short of those high ideas. And you can't adjust God's scales. You can't adjust God's standards. You can't adjust God's standards for righteousness just to match up with your life because they're fixed. And so you're going to fall short, and that doesn't make you a hypocrite. You know what a hypocrite is? It's somebody who uses religion to cover up their sin and promote their self. That's what they're trying to do. A hypocrite's not someone that falls short and fails, uh, but the the hypocrite is somebody who's a pretender. It, it's it's a it's a pretense what he does. Now, false righteousness there of the of the Pharisees, which although outwardly was very impressive, was revealed through this type of false devotion and this false honor uh, towards God in a false worship, and that it was only outward as well. Not only their acts of righteousness, but their very acts of devotion. Their devotion was insincere. It was dishonest. It was self-serving. It was meant to cover up their weaknesses and their failures. It was self-promoting. All that was done was done in front of the eyes of men. So that they could be promoted in the eyes of men. And Christ is speaking of a different type of devotion here that's needed. A true devotion. The true way to honor God. And he begins first with the matter of giving. He's talking about the matter of giving and giving alms to the poor. Uh, praying. Fasting. That he'll later on uh, begin to address there. That important disciplines as far as the religion of the Pharisees was concerned. And the Lord Jesus, who is the king, does not condemn these practices as a means of a Godward devotion but he does expose the hypocritical motives of the Pharisees in the way they did them. The Pharisees used almsgiving in a way to gain favor and attention of men, which was the wrong motive for giving to the poor. They tried to uh, magnify themselves in the way they gave. They foolishly believed their gifts were impressive to God as they were to men, and so they equated the praise of men with the approval of God and therefore, in their own minds, they were giants of, of, you know, of spirituality in their own mind because they were sure appreciated and respected by men. So when the king shows up, and he starts speaking the word of God, and the word of God's a fire, and the word of God's a hammer, and the word of God's a sword, and it's a light exposing the darkness and their hypocrisy, it makes them look bad in the eyes of men. And those good, godly, spiritual, theological giants get ready to kill him. 
without cause. I mean, you've got to watch out crossing somebody and making them look bad in front of people when that's all they're about. That's all they're interested in. They're pretenders. Outwardly, yes, they're righteous. But inwardly, they're like snakes, Jesus said. And they're cold up and they're ready to strike and they'll kill you. They'll kill you. Uh, the king exposes them. He just shows up and says, that's not what we're looking for. He can see right through it. That's not what we need here. The king wants a righteous kingdom. He doesn't want something that's just pretend. Something that's a cover. All those outward displays of all that they had given was to promote themselves in the eyes of men just so they could climb up another rung on the ladder. Because that's what they were. They're ladder climbers and they're looking to have that kind of honor. And uh, the king just shows them, hey, if you're just about men, everything you're doing is for nothing. It's for nothing. It doesn't mean anything. What does it mean? When, when, when is applause? When is it enough? When do you get the enough uh, pats on the back? I mean, when is it over as far as... Yeah, I mean, if that's what you're all about, you can't hear it enough, you can't feel it enough. Hey, people that live like that and want that, they can't get enough of it. And it just wears them out whenever it begins to go away. It just tears them up there. And so the Lord shows them, hey, you, everything you're doing is for nothing. Everything those Pharisees are doing, they're doing for the praise of men. And that just comes and goes and it changes. And it doesn't mean a thing. And then He showed them, hey, that even what they're doing is not for God. It's not for God. He wasn't pleased by what they were doing because of why they were doing it. He wasn't pleased with what they were doing because of why they were doing it. And that was revealed in how they were doing it. It was all a public show. Again, Christ said they did it for men's respect. And yes, they got it. But the implication is that's all they got. Because just like Cain's offering, the Lord had no respect for all that they were doing. They did it for men. And therefore, they're only going to get what men can give them. And so the momentary applause and the appreciation is all there is for a false devotion that's not done unto the Father. You see, that's the king for you. <laughs> he, he is driven for the Father. The king, our king, you understand? <laughs> He's all about the Father. He's jealous for Him. He's zealous for Him. And He's honored by the king. And He demands all His subjects honor His Father in that they do their devotions to the Father and not to men. Our sinful nature is so deceptive that it can defile even a simple act of devotion like giving. Jesus said, Take heed that you do not your alms before men to be seen of them. He said, Watch out for that. Take heed. Be warned. It can happen. You know, uh, you know the flesh never quits being the flesh. I've said it before. I don't know if I communicate this truth very well, but, but in a in a fight, you know, a boxing match, you watch that and you see them going at each other and there's a way they, they face each other in the center of the ring and then all once one of them gets one of those shots in there and uh, the other one's kind of staggering off and then the whole fight changes. He's not just still standing in the center of the ring with his dukes up. He just landed one. The other guy's staggering to the corner. Now the fight changes. There's a way that you, if you're in a prize fight, there's a way that you fight when you're in the center of the ring. There's a way you fight when you're on the ropes. And I say all that to say this, the flesh never quits fighting. And it never, listen, it never stops being the flesh. And you get in church and you read your Bible and you start witnessing and you start praying and you get those things in your life that you're supposed to have. Listen, the flesh may be on the ropes, but it's still there. And you've got to watch it. You know what the, the natural reaction is for a good Christian man or a good Christian woman? You know what the natural, the natural problem for a good man and a good woman is self-righteousness. That, that's just natural. You say, why? Because they're good. And the flesh just <laughs> changes. See, at first, flesh don't want that. Flesh don't want to be a part of that. Flesh don't want nothing to do with that. And all of a sudden, now the flesh is saying, ah, let's go. 
Make sure people see you. <laughs> do everything you do for people. Make sure people are watching. Make sure you do it in a way that people appreciate what you're doing. You say, what is that? That's a natural reaction, folks. You say, well, preacher, that's not my natural reaction. Oh, yes, it is. And, and oh, the Lord here, the king, is talking about giving. And he's talking about, hey, these folks, they get in there. And you know what happens? They sound a trumpet when they begin to give. And everybody's like, oh, look what they're giving. You know, if you're one of those guys that were given back in that day with somebody sounding a trumpet and you get in a crowd and all once a preacher starts preaching against those that sound a trumpet before they give, <laughs> you're going you're gonna to regret all that attention you got given when they sounded that trumpet just as soon as the lights of the Word of God comes on and says, all that's wrong and it's for nothing. All that trumpet blowing and all that applause and all that appreciation. Now, when the Word of God shines on that sin, suddenly you wish you was under a rock. You wish you, you weren't hearing what you were hearing. Christ is talking about putting yourself out for others. That's good. He's talking about giving without fanfare, giving with simplicity. More importantly, doing it with full faith that God knows what you're doing. God knows what you're giving. And, and with... And he appreciates what you're doing as long as you're doing it for God. I mean, he's worthy. If you want to help somebody out, you ought to do it for the Lord's glory and not your own. Amen. Uh, the Father who's watching, even in secret, shall reward you openly. What is that? That's just part of living by faith. So uh, we ask this question, must all giving be done secretly? Must it be done anonymously? I mean, I, I've been in... Baptist churches up in these hollers, and I've heard them preach against us taking up offerings. You know, what are we trying to do? We're passing a plate. All about money, love of money is the root of all evil. And they talk about taking up an offering in church and uh, preach against it and talk about how, you know, you can't do it in secret if you're taking up an offering in church. And, you know, you may, you may get that idea here in, in the Gospel of Matthew, but of course, uh, once you get over the book of Acts... <laughs> You're going to realize that they were taking up an offering there. And you're going to realize that, that Barnabas gave. And everybody knew what he gave. And the Lord appreciated what he gave. And the Lord rewards Barnabas for what he gave. Because he's not given to impress anybody. You know what the Holy Spirit's narrative statement about Barnabas was? That he was a good man. Full of the Holy Ghost. You know what he did? He gave publicly. People knew what he gave. So we're talking about motive here. Yeah. Only the king knows what your motive is. And he's, and he's trying to help us with something we may be in the dark with about ourselves. Because in that very situation, Ananias and Sapphira gets involved in giving. Only they wanted everyone to know what they gave. The problem with that was they weren't giving what they led everyone to think they were giving. And you can see what their motive is and their behavior so taints things so bad in that New Testament church setting. The Lord makes examples out of Ananias and Sapphira. Cost them their lives. You know what they, they died over an offering. <laughs> of all the things that goes on at church, I mean the singing, the preaching, the invitation. There's a lot of high points that we'd say, that's, that's a serious time. Listen, they're taking up an offering and Ananias and Sapphira died. That's serious time. The Lord's watching. You know what He does? He makes an example out of them. They were corrupt. They had a false devotion. They were pretenders. They were hypocrites. They were, their devotion was for outward, selfish purposes. It was not towards the Father. And God was hands-on in that early bunch. <laughs> so much so, those two didn't make it past the offering. <laughs> No, I'm glad the Lord don't start dropping us around here when our motives are bad. We wouldn't have enough to take up and off right Amen. But what are those? Those are examples to show how easy it can happen. How easy it can take place there. Another important part of true devotion involves a prayer life. And the motives behind our prayer life. The Lord says, When thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are. For they love to pray, stand in the synagogues, in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. He goes on to say, don't be like them. Don't be like them. I've heard people take that passage and try to preach against street preaching. 
They're on the street corners out there just to be seen of men. Again, the Lord's not talking about being public in your devotion. He's not condemning that. He's talking about the motives behind such. Now, Jesus is speaking of the simplicity of prayer, the matter of simply talking to God. Simple matter. No show. No performance. No one taking opportunity to promote themselves in the eyes of men. Just a sincere conversation with God that involves His praise, that involves giving thanks, that involves a humble confession of sin, that involves praying and interceding for others, and involves some humble requests. It's a simple matter there. It's a pattern Jesus provides for them here. And what He provides is a pattern. It's not the Lord's Prayer. It's religiously called so, but the Lord's not praying here. He's teaching on prayer. It's a pattern for praying to those disciples who were gospel kingdom preachers. And so He's teaching them to pray, Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. But the rebuke here, again, is for outward Action of pretense. Uh, where everyone that's watching seems to think, boy, that person is gloriously talking to God and communicating with God. And no one would know. But God knows. You, you, you know, it's not one of those things. The, the, bad react, the flesh here is going to react and say, well, I wonder if they're acting or this isn't what this instruction is given to us for to figure out when somebody's putting on the show because you and I will never know but the Lord knows the Lord knows what the what the uh, motive is behind the action there and the Lord's saying you know basically they're going on and on with these pretentious wrong prayers publicly they're getting the praise of men for what they're doing but that's all they're getting because God's not even listening. He doesn't even hear it. You know what? He's showing us that, that before there's some public praying, there needs to be some private praying going on. Uh, don't make the mistake of believing again that Christ is preaching against giving alms to the poor. <laughs> he wants you to give. He's not doing that. Uh, he's exposing a false motive there. And He's not preaching against public prayer either. He's just showing the hypocrisy behind them doing it wrong. Look over at John chapter 11. I'll try to hurry here. John chapter 11. Hold your place. In John chapter 11. Some say, well, public praying is not to be done. But there's nothing wrong with public praying. Paul the Apostle is giving instruction to Timothy in the book of 1 Timothy about how to behave himself in the house of God and how the things ought to run. And he says that First of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks may be made for all men. He says, for kings, for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet, peaceable life in all godliness and honesty, for this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. On down, he says, I will therefore that men pray everywhere, <laughs> lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. So just like there's not a designated place where we can pray, there's no designated place where you can pray. You want to pray on a street corner? Go right ahead. Just make sure you're not doing it to impress men. Of course, this day and time, I don't know how many people would be impressed. <laughs> Things have changed. But uh, Paul, the apostle there, uh, was involved in public praying. Uh, and and uh, Jesus, feeding the multitudes, the Bible says that he said, make the men sit down, and then he took what they had. And the Bible says he gave thanks. All eyes were on him. And he gave thanks. Here he is in John chapter 11 about to raise Lazarus from the dead. Look at verse 41. John eleven forty one 41. It says, Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me, and I knew that thou hearest me always, but because of the people which stand by, I said it, that they may believe that thou hast sent me. You know what Jesus is doing there? He's not only praying, it's not only publicly praying, but he says some things in his prayer for the purpose of people who are listening to him pray. <laughs> now, again, it's, well, you're not supposed to preach when you pray. Listen, there have been times I've been in a, you know, kind of a secular setting. They, they wanted to have a word of prayer, and they call on me because I'm the preacher, I'm the minister, so let's call on the, the preacher to pray. And man, I give it to both. both Barrels, everything I got, they hear the gospel before I close up. 
And you say, well, now that's pretentious. No, I'm not doing it for the praise of men, I assure you. I'm doing that to bear witness to the gospel. And for those Christians that are there, maybe edifying their faith, and that's what Jesus was doing. He said, I, I, I'm saying, God, I know you hear me, but I'm saying this because there's people listening to me pray, and, and I want them to believe right. <laughs> He's encouraging them. He's edifying them in their faith. Over in the book of Acts, they had shipwrecked there. And Paul's encouraging them that everything's going to be okay and he's trying to get them to eat something there. And it says that when he had thus spoken, he took bread and he gave thanks to God in the presence of them all. You know what Paul did? He publicly prayed. So what's the problem? Well, there is no problem in public praying. There is a problem in trying to perform an outward religious devotion just to receive praise from men. There's something wrong with that. The Lord said, you're, you're taking something that ought to be sacred and you're making it something for men. And the king is jealous. He wants our devotion to be towards the Father and not for men. Now the last point is over there in verse 16 there uh, that I'll mention tonight, and that's a fasting. <laughs> Speaking of being a hypocrite. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> But to speak on fasting, the Lord said this, Moreover, when you fast, be not as the hypocrites of a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces, that they may appear unto men to fast. Verily I say unto you that they have their reward. But thou, when thou fastest, anoint thine head, and wash thy face, that thou appear not unto men to fast, but unto thy Father which is in secret. And thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. Now let me just say at this time here that you're not given the command in Scripture to fast. Matter of fact, even the Jewish people that was required of them only one time to fast, and that was on that annual day of atonement, according to Leviticus chapter 23, verse 27. And the Pharisees, now what they did is they had imposed this discipline on themselves. And there's nothing wrong with that. They fasted twice a week. They did it on Monday and Thursday there, and Jesus gives that information as He talks about of the Pharisee and the publican standing there to pray, and how that the publican, he wouldn't even look up, and he prayed. He said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. But the Pharisee standing right next to him saying, Lord, I thank you that I'm not like this sinner over here. I'm not like this publican over here. And he goes on and on listing his credentials to the Lord, and he mentions in those credentials that he fasted twice a week. Now, not only did they impose this discipline on themselves, they did so in such a way that people knew they were fasting. Now, let me say this. Fasting is good. Biblically speaking, it is a good thing. That is, if we do it in the right way, with the right motive. Uh, Jesus fasted, according to Matthew chapter 4. Uh, uh, the early church fasted, according to Acts chapter 13. Fasting helps to discipline the appetites of the body to keep our spiritual priorities right. Amen. There, there's a warning given in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 7, about you know, uh, it could become an opportunity for temptation. So a person has to be aware of that. But just to simply deprive yourselves of a natural benefit, particularly food, some people do with sleeping. If that's the case, I'm fasting all the time. <laughs> I fasted last night, and I fasted the night before. But, but particularly food, that's the context of fasting in the Bible. And, uh, and, and just to deprive yourself of that, is not in and of itself fasting. Fasting that, that is God-honored is a fast that honors God. And it deals with a true devotion there, or else there is no lasting spiritual benefit. Uh, the Pharisees would disfigure their faces. They would become of a sad countenance. They wanted everyone to be able to tell by looking at them. They were on a fast. And uh, in all this, Jesus is preaching. He's ultimately just trying to rip the mask off of these pretenders. And he's trying to show you, hey, you see those guys over there with their sad faces? The ones that give when the trumpet sounded? The ones that, that stand and pray on the street corners just to be heard of men making long, pretentious speeches? Those guys? He says they're hypocrites. That's not the righteousness we're looking for in the kingdom. I want the outward stuff just to be the outward stuff. To cover up the wicked stuff. I want it to be genuine, sincere, in truth. And he's showing that their outward devotion was just simply signs of their hypocrisy. He's not condemning what they're doing. He's condemning why 
and he's shown it to be empty, and it's without reward. You know, you start to go down that path whenever your reputation becomes more important than your character. Whenever you become more concerned with what people are thinking about you than what you know to be true. And, and folks, that's an easy trap to fall into, and it can even be fallen into on sincere ground. As I've said before, nobody wants to endorse weakness or wickedness. And therefore, we put on our best face for one another and we play the man. And sometimes you've got to do that. But you can get caught in that rut for so long that that's all you're doing. You're just playing. And it's an act. And you're caught up with it. And now people think something of you and you don't want to disappoint them. And what you are when you're by yourself, you know, that's, that's one thing, you know. But what do people think of you? That's really what's important. And that's the pathway to pretense. You become a showman. Hypocrisy robs us of true Christian character. There is no spiritual benefit to the showmanship. There's no spiritual benefit. I, I don't care if it's giving, if it's praying, if it's fasting. There's no spiritual benefit to its mere showmanship. If it's done for men, if it's done for self-promotion, there's no spiritual benefit. Therefore, there's no development of Christian character. There's no growth in grace. You do not benefit in your spirit at all. There's no Christian virtue that is produced through pretense. Also, hypocrisy robs of all spiritual rewards. Not only does it not pay off spiritually here, but it doesn't pay off later at the judgment seat of Christ. God has no respect for what we do for the mere attention of men. He has no respect. We have traded the temporary praises of men for the eternal approval of God. And there's no reward for it. And then also hypocrisy robs of spiritual influence. Hypocrisy, again, is not failing. It's not falling short. You know, a matter of fact, I mean, it's a matter of being transparent in front of people where they can tell it's not an act that you have a real walk with the Lord, you have a real relationship with the Lord. And does that mean that they never see you do something wrong? You know as well as I do, that's impossible. I mean, you talk about the Old Testament commands and how they majored on the outward until you get to some of those that deal right with the heart. Think about just some of the Christian commands we have. I mean, rejoice evermore. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> well, that's pretty hard to do. Uh, and we could go on. Be thankful for everything. <laughs> I mean, that's pretty hard to do. So people are going to see you come short. They're going to see you fail. And as long as you have a good, humble reaction, and you keep that thing between you and the Lord, under the blood, get rid of it, forsake it, and get back on your feet and get walking again, and they realize that you've repented, uh, they'll realize there's something genuine there. That's consistent with our testimony anyway. We are sinners that need to be saved. We, we don't claim that now that we are saved, there's nothing wrong with us. <laughs> that's not our testimony at all. And so that's not an act we have to put on. Not for uh, each other. <laughs> And not for this world. There ought to be some correction in our behavior. Don't get me wrong. Amen. There ought to be repentance. It ought to be a lifetime effort. Whenever we've done something wrong to confess it before the Lord and, and get rid of it. But what's with the act? Amen. What does it matter that some brother thinks you're this outstanding Christian? Some sister just thinks you're, you know, You've got this walk right next to God and it never goes awry. What does it matter that, that people think you're a spiritual giant or not? None of that matters. We ought to do what we do for the Father. We ought to do what we do for His glory and for His honor. The Bible warns against feigned love, feigned faith. People can feign compassion. You heard the story of the burly man that visited a preacher and his wife because they were known for giving. And he told a story there. He said, there's a woman, her husband died, and they got all these children. And 
the children are hungry, they're doing without. And he said uh, that something needs to be done because they're about to be put out by their landlord on the street if their rent's not paid. They owe four hundred dollars, and the pastor's wife started writing checks. Said, "My, I said we can't allow that." And she said, "Who are you?" He said, "I'm the landlord." <laughs> Seemed, seemed like he was concerned. It was an act. It was an act. See, that's what people can't stand. People can't stand the act. They don't mind the weakness. As long as you're sincere. They can't stand the pretense. Worse than that. God can't stand it either. He has no respect for it. None at all. You know what the king's looking for? He's looking for true devotion. True righteousness. He wants it to be real. Like they say, keep it real. <laughs> That's what the king's looking for. That being said, let's stand for prayer. Your heads are bowed. We're going to go to the Lord in prayer here. The king, our king, is zealous for his father. I'm just saying this evening here, if you're going to go to church, go for the father. You're going to learn the Bible, learn it for Him. You're going to pray, you're going to fast, you're going to give, do it for the Father. You're going to give out tracts and witness for the Gospel, do it for the Father. Let everything you do be done for Him. And not just for what people think. Because it doesn't matter what people think. They're only going to applaud so long. They're only going to pat you on the back so often. Eventually they're going to get tired of talking about you and talking about somebody else if they ever talk about you to begin with. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. All that matters is, is the Father pleased? What He's pleased with, He'll reward openly. Father, we thank You, Lord God, for the light of Your Word that exposes the weaknesses in our life, the crevices, the fault lines. Lord, we need adjustment in our motives from time to time. Just a good wake-up call about what's going on. What we what pressure we put on ourselves, what pressure we feel that others put on us, what, what pressure the world puts on us, Lord. There's all sorts of burdens out there. We need to realize, God, that, that what we're doing, we're doing for You. We're doing because You told us to. We're doing it because we want to please You. And Lord, uh, if we have the right motive, there's a great chance we'll do it right. And I pray, God, that You'll just help us to understand that, be sober about that truth tonight, make adjustments according to Your will. There we head bound.